Hi, everyone. Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Benjamin Quinn, and on behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard University Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, I'm excited to introduce this virtual event with Moshe Hoffman and Erez Ueli, presenting their co-authored book, Hidden Games. Sorry, y'all. Something over my screen. Presenting the co-authored book, Hidden Games, The Surprising Power of Game Theory to Explain Irrational Human Behavior in Conversation with Andrew McAfee. I hope you're all well and safe. Thank you so much for joining us virtually. Today's event is the latest installment in our Harvard Science Book Talk series, which works to bring the authors of recently published science literature to our Cambridge community and beyond. This Wednesday, April 13th, we'll host celebrated zoologist Eric Kirschenbaum for a discussion of his book, The Zoologist's Guide to the Galaxy, what animals on earth reveal about aliens and ourselves in conversation with Lewis Gross. To learn more about this and our other upcoming virtual events, you can visit harvard.com and sign up for our email newsletter or check out the page harvard.com backslash science for more info. I'll also be posting a link to our science research public lectures channel in the chat where you can view previous talks you might have missed. Today's discussion will conclude with some time for your questions. If you have a question for our authors at any time during the talk, click the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and we'll get through as many as time allows. In the chat, I'll be posting a link to purchase hidden games on harvard.com. Your purchases and financial contributions make events like today's possible and help ensure the future of a landmark independent bookstore. Thank you to our partners at Harvard University and thank you all for showing up and tuning in in support of authors, publishers, indie book selling, and especially for science. And finally, as you have no doubt experienced in virtual gatherings, technical issues may arise. If they do, we'll do our best to resolve them as quickly as possible. Thank you so much for your patience and understanding. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. Moshe Hoffman is a research scientist at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Biology, a research fellow at MIT's Sloan School of Management, and a lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics. His research focuses on using game theory, models of learning and evolution, and experimental methods to decipher the motives that shape our social behavior. Erez Ueli is a research scientist at MIT's Sloan School of Management, the director of MIT's Applied Cooperation Team, and a lecturer at Harvard's Department of Economics. His research focuses on altruism, understanding how it works and how to promote it, and he regularly collaborates with governments, nonprofits, and companies to apply the lessons of this research towards addressing real-world challenges. And Andrew McAfee is the co-founder and co-director of MIT's Initiative on the Digital Economy and a principal research scientist at the MIT Sloan School of Management. He's the author of More From Less and the co-author of The Second Machine Age and his next book, The Geek Way, will be published by Little Brown in 2023. This afternoon, Moshe, Arez, and Andrew have joined us for a discussion of hidden games. Moshe and Arez's tremendous examination of the practical applications of game theory, which Nicola Rahaney, the author of The Social Instinct calls a fascinating tour of how game theory can explain the intricacies and quirks of human behavior, and Hoffman and Ueli are expert guides. This is a book I will come back to again and again. Finding a surprising middle ground between the hyper-rationality of classical economics and the hyper-irrationality of behavioral economics, Hidden Games offers a compelling, insightful explanation of our most puzzling behavior, from the mechanics of Stockholm Syndrome and internalized misogyny to why we help strangers and have a sense of fairness. We've got a lot to learn this afternoon. So without further ado, I am absolutely delighted to turn things over to our speakers. The digital podium is all yours, Arez, Moshe, and Andrew. Benjamin, thanks very much. And on behalf of Ian Mo, and to be clear, I can't call these to Moshe and Erez, so I'm going to do Ian Mo. We really want to thank a Harvard Bookstore for hosting us. It's an iconic independent bookstore. I, I'm sure the three of us have all spent countless hours lost in the store, and we're very grateful. Uh, we're going to have some time at the end for your questions, so please do include them in the chat. We're fascinated to hear what's on your mind. But as a devoted reader of this book, I have a ton of questions for these two. So we're going to dive right in. Guys, you've written in a, a book about applied game theory. Game theory is one of the great intellectual contributions, I think, of the 20th century by, by super geniuses. That's probably not an exaggeration. Do we need to also be super geniuses to understand game theory and apply it and even get through a book about it? Definitely. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> Next week, quantum mechanics. <laughs> Game theory has at its core um, a very simple uh, set of 
tools and insights that it provides um, and ones that one can distill. Um, of course, one can get, uh, one can take it to the point where very few people can understand it, but uh, a lot of the stuff that we would be talking about in a book like this with an audience that is non-expert would be uh, simple. Game theory, I think, will is something that one can use to understand things that one encounters on an everyday basis and to really distill uh, a key feature of those kinds of interactions. Things like, this is a situation that's positive sum, or things like, this is a situation where um, this, there's an element of coordination involved. What is the domain of game theory? Like, what, what does it help us yeah. understand? Well, traditionally, it helps us understand things like Cold War dynamics, or how much you should bid in an auction, or even like a parlor game, like, like when you should bluff in poker. Um, that's the traditional set of applications. Fine. And I, I guess, over the past 40 or so years, there have been other applications in biology to like why peacocks have long tails or, or why animals can be territorial, territorial. So like these kind of evolutionary applications. The set of domains that we apply game theory to is a little bit different. We're thinking about things like quirky features of our pro-social preferences, like why we're altruistic or the weird ways we're altruistic or, or spin and motivated reasoning, the way that we try to persuade each other and, and our own like fallacious beliefs um, or like, you know, our aesthetic sense. So like why rap has like these like intricate rhyming schemes, things like that. So so new domains that involve so, more- I want to make sure I'm following. Altruism, yeah. spin, yeah. Aesthetics, yeah, that's right. Rap lyrics, yeah, that's what, right. What do these things have in common? Good. Where game theory is the toolkit that you Good. guys chose to explain Good. it. They are weird aspects of our preferences, beliefs, ideologies, passions, principles. These kind of weird things that humans kind of take for granted in the way that we think, in the way that we talk, in the way that we act. Um, but they all have in common that they're social. Okay, so so you might not even think about it that way, but like. A sense of I, aesthetics. I don't think my aesthetics is social. That's right. That's right. But your point is that they are. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so my point is that part of what you're doing as a rap artist is, is you're signaling things about yourself, but also as a, as a consumer of rap, I might be signaling, you know, the kinds of things that, that I value or the kinds of things that I can appreciate or, or, or the kind of creativity that I have. And it am is I a social you, Am game. I following you that, that so, that, okay. Signaling is a fundamentally social activity. Absolutely. Aesthetics are a form of signaling. Am yeah. I on board? Yeah, I think that that's right. And I think that uh, uh, humans are very, very social animals. And a lot of things that we, we take to be not social, that they just feel like, well, I just like, this just feels right. Or this is just what I believe. Yeah. Like those things at their core, even if we're not consciously aware of it, they are still uh, shaped by social pressures, by, by either the effect you'll have on other people by signaling these things, or the effect other people will have on you by positively reinforcing those behaviors. Or the I'm hearing two things, and I want to make sure I got it right. That A, th these are fundamentally social phenomena, not individual phenomena, and B, that they're not always conscious. Absolutely. So that's part of, I think, what's unique about the way that we're thinking of game theory is it's not, it doesn't require conscious awareness, conscious strategizing for the game theory to come into play. So in the Cold War dynamics, the, you know, Kissinger was consciously calculating what's the best way to, to deter the Soviet Union. That, that's not like traditionally, that's what game theory is thought to, to require is conscious strategic thought. For us, game theory doesn't require that. Game theory could come into play through subconscious processes because of things like cultural evolution, because of things like, like reinforcement learning, uh, the, the strategic elements can still affect us being embedded in our so beliefs and preferences. Are you guys saying that, that actually we're all very good at game theory? Yes and no. In that um, the way that uh, if you are to think that each individual person is their mind is actually engaged in playing a, a game consciously and they're calculating yeah. all the stuff, the answer is no. But thank you, Dick Thaler. Thank you, Danny Kahneman. All the behavioral world has been telling us we're bad at consciously strategizing. Two Great. Nobel Prizes. Yeah. But at the same time, there, the, our preferences, our tastes, our beliefs, our intuitions, with our sense of justice, with our sense of aesthetics, it is playing a game, a hidden game, a game that we are not conscious of, but it's playing that we're game that's very that. good at that. And we're, we're, all of us are good at that. That's right. By ver and the reason we know that is because we do things like have taste and engage in altruism. And, and those things are shaped by co cultural evolution over the course of like many generations and thousands of people you're getting information from. So, so every time your tastes are imi imitating somebody else who's really successful, or, you know, if you look at, you know, what pop stars are doing and you try to like dress like them or talk like them. But, but that's like, conscious, isn't it? Like if I'm, if I'm, 
If I want, if I'm, if I'm a believer, I dress like yeah, Justin. Yeah, a little bit, but okay. sometimes not. Sometimes you're just like, oh, I kind of like Justin's style. And like what's going on is subconsciously, you see Justin is like really successful. That makes you want to imitate him. You're not consciously thinking, I'm going to dress just like him so I can be like him. What you're thinking is he's cool. That's cool. Maybe, you know, that's a cool style. Maybe I'll try that too. And then you but try it. And if it I'm works for you, about, you do I'm it again. I'm thinking about that if I'm hearing right. I'm thinking about that sometimes consciously. Sometimes. But that's the tip of the iceberg. And the iceberg is actually... Of other kinds deeper. of imitation than one. That's right. That's right. Okay. And and so sometimes consciously you can figure out optimal strategies. You can do fairly well with your consciousness. Sometimes not. Sometimes it doesn't work so well because of like the behavioral critique that, that we mentioned before with Kahneman and, and Thaler point out. We're, we're, our consciousness has its limitations. But even even but sometimes it'll get it right. But even even when it gets it wrong, you'll still be imitating. You'll still be learning from others. You'll still be trying things out. And if they don't work, then because, you'll try something different. Because that's part of human nature? Human nature. We are, we are very oh, yeah. social creatures, not just in our social interactions, but the way that we socially learn. And we're also, we're, we're animals that try things out. We're, and, and when they don't work we do something else okay i want to make sure i'm with you and because we're deep we're so deeply social as a species mm. we interact all the time game and learning from each other game theory and learn from each other game theory is a great tool okay because it's all about interacting agents is that the right chain well, of reasoning it's, it's about interacting agents so there's kind of two senses in which we're interacting agents one sense is like is like we're playing games with each other and so game theory will help us understand how those games work okay. but the second sense is that we're also learning from each other and that will help us optimize even without conscious awareness so the justification for using game theory yes. is social as well as the fact that game theory it's good for analyzing social scenarios they're kind of both there okay Two separate social elements you guys have heard you say the word evolution a couple of different times but you said it in kind of a weird context you talked about cultural evolution yeah that's right well, as i read your book one phrase that did not occur in the book as far as i can tell was evolutionary psychology yeah, yeah. which is kind of a popular discipline are you guys not evolutionary psychologists yeah well we, we steal a little bit from evolutionary psychology and we're, we're definitely standing on the shoulders of some very smart evolutionary psychologists, okay. but there are some subtle differences. Okay. So evolutionary psychology is this field that says, if you want to understand human behavior, if you want to understand the human mind, you need to think about, uh, to put it bluntly or, or, or stereotype a little bit, you need to think about the savannah. You need to think about sure. what, what would have been good for humans you know, 10,000, 100,000 years ago when we were, when our minds were biologically evolving. And that helps me understand my preference for salty, fatty, exactly. sugary food. That's right. Like that's, that's actually right. the right that's way right. to think about it. Absolutely. Great. There's no so way where, to like, Where does it go off? Where does it go off the rails? Or what, where's your difference with these folks? Mm -hmm. It's a difference in emphasis. One is an, an emphasis on evolved preferences that evolved. What would have been then, good on the savannah? Like the salt uh, and fat example, why we right. like bacon. But one is- uh, My a, taste for modern art is not in that category. That's right. It Definitely is not. not. Mondrian did not exist on the savannah. Um, but but didn't didn't he isn't he paint in a way that my eyeballs love because of the symmetry? Maybe, maybe, maybe some but, elements of it. Maybe you like some. Maybe he's taking advantage of like your like of symmetry by slightly breaking it or things like that. Oh, but, okay. but some of the elements here, the abstraction there, presumably is something that you are learning in a shorter time frame than so, just since the. Summer. Let's give so, a concrete example, if I can. Go ahead. Okay. So so we talk when we talk in, in the signaling uh, uh, chapter. Right. There's all sorts of uh, uh, signaling models that have biological explanations. So we mentioned the peacock tails. Why do peacocks have long tails? It's a good way to, to signal that the fit for peacocks to like them. That biologically evolved, right? Okay. But, right. but there are many examples of costly signaling that we also talk about, which clearly are not biologically evolved. Let me give you an example of that. Um, when I was in uh, Northeast India doing research, one thing that I noticed is like this fingernail and this fingernail was really long. Okay. And, and if you ask people there, as we did, you know, why, why, why do you have these long fingernails? They'll tell you it's beautiful. That's it. That's what they told us. It just looks It just good. looks good. Exactly. They had no other explanation than that. It was just deeply embedded in their preferences. They find it beautiful. No, you and I, I mean, again, we all know that we have culturally specific aesthetic senses. You and I, uh, I don't think find it beautiful. I mean, we don't, we don't grow our fingernails along like this. It seems to be culturally specific. And you can ask okay, so why that, in that culture. That's so the Savannah explanation does not work. It does not that. work there or else we would have the same preference. Yeah, we don't. So that tells us there's something about the culture. And the story that we'll give is, well, what they're doing is, they, they couldn't tell us this. It's not conscious. Again, the game, the game is hidden, but, but the game is hidden. The game is hidden. That's right. right. But what is the game there? It seems as though all the people with these long fingernails are the people who aren't working the field, who they're not cultivating rice, like the majority of the population that, that I was visiting. Instead, what they are is they're the few people who are the, the mayors, the school teachers, the secretaries. So they're signaling that I don't have to work the field. I can grow out these long nails. They're sending this costly signal. 
I can afford to grow out these long nails because I don't have to work the field. So that, that's a valuable signal to convey. They're not aware that they're conveying it. They just find it beautiful. But again, in our culture, we don't need to convey that because in, we're not in that, agricultural. In that culture, it's the equivalent of a peacock tail. That's right. That's right. Fine. And we have peacock tails in our culture too, for sure. Is there a culture that's immune to peacock tails? No. So that part might be, might be biologically involved, the, the desire to signal. But the ways in which we signal are going to be culture specific. And so the ways in which you signal, you have to learn you got... from culture. Okay, and so one of the other things innate. you guys have taught me in the book is that cultures evolve much more quickly than bio, than organisms do. Yeah. And, and cultural evolution helps us understand a lot of the hidden games. That's right. They're not universal, they're culture specific, That's right. but they're still, they're, in, they're evolved things that we've learned to do. Yeah. And I mean, certainly there's, you know, human beings evolved. Certainly our capacity to signal, our capacity to, to learn, those things had to evolve. So, so yep. and, and that's the sense, I mean, of course, we're standing on the shoulders of evolutionary psych. We have to, some, our brains had to, had to biologically evolve. But the, th but in order to understand the specific features, the specific, for instance, ways in which yep. we signal, that requires thinking through cultural evolution. Got it. So there are two kinds of evolution going on. Ignoring either of them yes. is a fairly bad strategy. That's right. That's right. One of the cool things that you guys do in this book is you frame it around puzzles. Mm -hmm. uh, and puzzles are kind of great because they, they make your brain work. They're, they're kind of weird. We like thinking about puzzles. Yeah. E, hit us with a cavalcade mm -hmm. of puzzles. Uh, that, that you tackle in the book. I want to give I want to give everybody a, an idea of the range of stuff that you think is amenable to your kinds of analyses. Yeah, absolutely. So we started out talking about our sense of aesthetics. So you've already seen some of those. Why do some people like long fingernails, others not? Why do some people like fairer skin? Now we tend to like people having tan skin. We talk about uh, hip hop and rap and why we tend to build entire art forms around artificial constraints, like you have to rhyme your words. There's a, a set of puzzles around a sense of aesthetics. Another set of puzzles we might tackle in the book are things around uh, rhetoric. So for instance, there's the fact that everybody presumably here knows that you have uh, entire uh, uh, cable channels uh, focused on uh, one side of the aisle versus the other. We've all got the crazy uncle who only watches Fox News, and we've all got the very liberal folks on the other side who are only watching MSNBC and CNN. Uh, and each one of those sides the thing that they're doing oftentimes and the thing that they yell at the other side for doing and then kind of ignore that they're doing it is that they only show the things that are good for their side. So, for instance, when Fox News is covering uh, some event that's really bad about Trump, the way they cover it is by not covering it, whereas CNN is constantly hammering in on those uh, those sides. So you could ask the question, why is it the case that these cable news networks uh, are only presenting the side that's good for them? Right. Not what's what's the hidden game there? It sounds pretty obvious. They're just partisan hacks whichever side you're on that they're not on. But the thing that you have to wonder here is why is it the case that everybody kind of knows this about CNN and Fox okay. and yet it persists. Mm -hmm. And so you have to ask, why is it that even though we know that CNN and Fox are doing this and that their yeah. viewers are only so, watching them and so on, that it persists. Can I for, for, <laughs> no, hold on. I want, I want you to finish the story. Why does it persist? Here, we're cutting into the middle because we've got to come back to the kinds of puzzles that we have. But uh, here, what we would do is we would focus on uh, two key elements of the, uh, the, the game theory highlights here that are an explanation for this phenomenon. One is um, the fact that people are actually not necessarily engaged in uncovering the truth. They don't really have an, in an incentive in these political do domains to uncover the truth, but rather to signal something about a, a group membership or to, to persuade others that a particular thing is um, is. Uh, the, the, the their right political thing. side is the good side. Yeah. yeah, their political side is the good side. So then, uh, so there's a persuasion element. Yep. And, and private information. That's the second element. So you have this, um, the fact that you know what evidence is out there. You, maybe you're a news anchor and you're out there in the field looking to find out like, what should I tell my audience about? You know what you can tell them about. They don't necessarily know that. And so you pick and choose and you only show them the stuff that's good for the side. And importantly, if you, if you lie by commission, if you like make up facts, that's much more likely to get you caught, much more likely to get you in trouble. You'll be seen as much more dishonest. But when you just leave out facts, you know, there's an asymmetry, leaving out facts, it lies of omission, get punished less, the harder to detect. Yep. And, and so we take advantage of this in the way that we spin. We spin, we tend to spin by leaving things out instead of making things up. That's and, why we don't say, we don't see so many bald faced lies on a lot of networks, but we right. do see just really, right. really, really slanted coverage. That's right. There's a good that's reason right. for that. And this is a case where the game theory 
you're right. Here, the game isn't really hitting. We all kind of know Fox News. Okay, so great. So we all know partisan. We can we can come up with an explanation. Give us some great examples of where the game really is more what hidden motivated. and where we need the toolkit that you guys lay out to help us understand what's actually going on. Yeah, I mean, you can you can kind of very naturally transition from thinking about ex- overt spin of this kind great. to what do people part- who are partisan believe? And then Good. in fact, thinking about, so, you know, everybody has that partisan friend who is totally bought into the propaganda. Right, and they, why are other people such idiots? It's kind of an interesting yeah. question, Yeah, that's right? right. Well, why? Well, but one thing that, that you're seeing here is the spin gets internalized. So if you're used to only presenting one side, as you said, they are the game we kind of see like you're just in persuasion mode right. what's interesting the way in which it gets hidden is you start to believe it yourself it gets internalized and you you end up with being a motivated reasoner so this is like you know a lot of psychologists have shown that we end up with fallacious beliefs ourselves and you know the classic explanation of where do our fallacious beliefs yeah. come from is you just believe what you want to be true and the, we're actually right. saying something slightly different or you're here. an idiot or you're an idiot, yeah. You guys are not saying either of those Exactly. Things. What we're saying is actually all you're doing is, is you're in persuasion mode and it turns out that part of being a good persuader is you end up internalizing it and believing it yourself. And so, so the so thing that's good for- if you're in an for, interview, why would you believe that you're not going to be good for this job? That's not a good thing to believe. Because somebody <laughs> that's might right. uncover that's a you terrible it interview. That's right. right. So you're going to be overconfident. That's right. So the social thing of, of trying to persuade gets internalized and ends up affecting your own beliefs in a way that it then ends up being hidden. So you might not- so partisan hacks would not agree with the label, I'm a partisan hack. No, That's they right. know the truth. They, right, I'm in possession of the truth and you're not. And the other half is completely lost. Uh-huh. That, that's right. That's and so at that point, point, the game gets hit. That is a more self At that way. point, the game becomes it. One of, one of the most fascinating things for me in the book, there's, there's a lot of great puzzles here. The altruism section is fascinating to me because so much of, I learned so much of what's actually going on yeah. is weird until you understand the hidden game. Yeah, that's so, right. so talk to us about altruism. I guess there are two follow-on questions, two questions. One is why are we, we're, we're selfish yeah. species, why be altruistic? But what you guys highlight is we're actually weirdly bad at it. Yeah, yeah exactly. You have, you do see humans engage in an enormous amount of altruism, something that people have puzzled about. And we stand out in some ways as being more cooperative than many others uh, say primates. Do I understand altruism and cooperation are kind of similar here? We use it. Here? We use yeah, it we're gonna use it the same way. Okay. Um, Cooperation is technically borrowed from biology. No, 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 no. But, just go yeah. on. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, on, on the one hand, you do have this this intensely cooperative, altruistic uh, um, species. On the other hand, it's very. Is, is it weird that we are altruistic from your viewpoint? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this was. If you ask Darwin what kept him up at night, there were two things. One was the signaling stuff about peacock's tails. He didn't and understand the altruism. peacock's tail. Yeah. Yeah. He was like, "How can that be consistent with with the worldview where where the, its survival?" Of I mean, I, I think we share the worldview with Richard Dawkins, which may, may, maybe of uh, many of your viewers would share the, the idea of the selfish gene, sure. which is like selfishness is easy to understand. Like evolution is inherently a selfish process. The thing that's the thing that's puzzling to scientists has always been why are we so non-selfish? Great. And and yeah, so so that's the starting point. Why do we give so much? And as is there, Eric, can you, is there a like two sentence explanation for why we're actually very altruistic or cooperative? As one species? word sentence: reputation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. People, oh. people will trust you more. They'll, they'll give you more power over them. The more likely to want to build a relationship with you okay. if you're cooperative. Important caveat: remember the word hidden. There's no sense in which that's what you're thinking about when oh, you're no. being altruistic. Oh, no. You oh, want to help the world. You just want to do the, the right thing. It feels well, we're not good. a bunch of conniving people. Absolutely. Of course. Not. Okay, fine. Yeah. It's so, very genuinely held in okay. that sense. So game is it. now I understand why we're a super cooperative species. Yeah. But tell me, but first of all, highlight how weird we are at our altruism and then unpack what's going good. on there. Absolutely. Um, so every year when we start this part of our course, for instance, the, the thing that I do is, it's a little mean, but I, I start by talking about Habitat for Humanity, which is this very well-respected organization. Most of the folks in the audience would know it. And what they do is they build housing and community centers in places where they need more. Are you guys about to housing. dump on Habitat we for Humanity? Definitely about to dump on Habitat for Humanity. Holy, okay, fine. Sorry <laughs> to all the people who have volunteered for Habitat for Humanity and to all my former students who every year have to go through the spiel. Because at some point, you know, I asked the students, can you raise your hand and, and tell us, you know, have you participated in Habitat for Humanity? And they proudly raised their hands. Wait, and year by year, do you have a student or two who has actually swung the hammer for Habitat? Absolutely. Okay. Every year there's somebody in the audience. And they're the hero in the class because they've mm-hmm. done the right thing. Absolutely. Everybody's like kind of, you know, looking at them in a nice way, almost clapping, not quite. Um, and then at that point I say, well, think about Habitat for Humanity. It is, it's a good org by, by our usual standards. Mm-hmm. But if you think about it for a second, it's kind of a weird organization because if your goal is to build as much housing as possible, 
The best way to do that might not be to fly a bunch of undergraduate students who have never held a hammer in their life from Cambridge, Massachusetts, to Central America or South America or East Asia in order to build houses. You could hire somebody there who builds houses for a lot less money. Literally take the money that you use to fly that person and you could hire people to build Which would houses. probably buy many hours a of builder houses. labor in Central America right. and put people to work. And 100%. We, and everybody in Central America would be better off as a result? Mm -hmm. Yes and no. We'll come back to that okay. point. But before we come back to that point, this is something that we can generalize a little bit. We can see in a variety of different ways that while people do good, the way in which they do good tends to be highly ineffective. Another way to see this is- Okay, so it's not that it's worthless to do habitat. No. It's just weirdly ineffective. Yeah. That's right. If you're doing like a dollars per square foot built or something like that. that. Yeah. Exactly. And okay. if your goal is what we claim it is, which is to help the world, this would be a, a weird way to do that. Especially after you guys are jerks and you highlight the dollars per square foot. That's right. Then yeah. nobody should do this anymore. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. yet they still they do. Still do. So that's right. so that, that's just something weird is going on with our, our sense of altruism. But you guys have found it's not just habitat, right? Altruism in general has this feature of being kind of ineffective. That's, That's right. right. So if you look at the, the effective altruism community, they'll highlight this. Um, what happens is people tend to give to and, and donate their time, like in this example, to charities that sometimes do exactly the same thing, but will do it in wildly different ways and therefore wildly less or more effective ways. Okay. The, the same cha charities that have the same exact goals can differ in effectiveness tenfold, hundredfold, thousandfold and still continue to exist for decades, which suggests people are giving to those charities that really aren't doing very much relative to the alternatives. Whereas in the business world that I'm more familiar with, if you are a thousand times less effective right. than the competition, you, right. you are pretty quickly going to go right. away. Yes, this right. is not how giving yeah. right. works, even though we all agree giving is important. Exactly. Okay. And that suggests so, that- So then what, what, what the hell is going on? Well, for starters, it suggests that there's something different about what's motivating our giving behavior ah. than what's motivating our, say, investment behavior. Great. When you're investing in a stock, you want return. But something is causing you that when you invest in a charity, you're not looking for return. You're looking for something else. Now, consciously, we'll tell each other, oh, I actually, you know, you make it sound like you're looking for return. I want to help the world. Again, I want to have an impact. Again, you're not lying. You're not deliberately lying. To Absolutely. The it's people. all subconscious. But right. subconsciously, this suggests something else is driving our altruism. What could that be? What could that be? Eris, Eris hinted at, at, at reputation earlier. And there are a few interesting things about the way reputation work that game theory will help us understand that show up and could explain some of these odd features. Including? So, for instance, when you give, it has to be highly observable, right? I mean, there's no way to affect your reputation, but other people can't, yeah, can't great. see it. So, uh, and so observability, observability, observability is the thing that comes up over and over, over, and over. In, your, in the book and in your world. That's right. And giving has to be, it, it, for this to work, has to be in, observable. In your view of the world, observable. Yeah, that's right. And when it great. is observable, people will give more and people will, mm. will give in more observable ways. Now, not everybody, in the, there will be exceptions when people give anonymously and stuff, and we have a chapter on that too. But okay. let, setting, setting that aside for now, generally observability matters a lot. Observ okay? yep. And if you want to, you know, Ares has this field experiment that we also talk about in the book, where like, if you just make, for instance, you know, not just giving, but other pro-social behaviors like uh, doing energy efficient things. If you make that more observable to your neighbors by say having your sign up sheet into the lobby so that all your neighbors can see that you signed up, Boom. people sign up a lot more. Yeah. So so observability matters. You make your recycling in a green bag that's see through, yeah, yeah, yeah. people recycle more. Yeah. Okay. So observability again, this is part because of our reputation that's right. as a very social that's right. species matters a exactly. Great now deal. consciously people will say I recycle because I care about the environment. Yeah. But lo and behold, when your recycling is more observable to your neighbor, you start caring about the environment more. It just kind of triggers that psychology. It triggers the psychology. Which is how the psychology should work if it's being driven by reputation. That's right. And you guys think that's what your explanation, the hidden game is is altruism is kind of about reputation. Yeah, it's a, yeah, that's it's, right. it's a reputation that's management right. system of sorts. Yeah, that's right. So this is, I want to dive in a little bit deeper on this because this brings up a, a couple kind of deep points about the worldview that you guys are um, putting out there. A lot of these stories get critiqued for being just so stories. Mm. You're telling a, a convincing story, like mm. I'm buying it. Mm. There are probably other stories out there about why we give and why it's so ineffective. Yeah. But, but, 
I've heard you all make the point that that your you and your peers have banged away at other explanations and they don't hold up all That's right. that well yeah. for things like our weird altruism. That's uh, right. Talk a little bit about the experiment that one of your colleagues did That's to try right. to rule out some other explanations yeah. for yeah. why we give. So, so the, one thing in our book, as you mentioned, we, we like to give a lot of puzzles. We also like to explain the rudimentary uh, uh, insights of game theory, right. these simple models. And then we also like to present evidence, like to make sure we're not just doing just those stories. Great. Okay. And so a type of evidence that we will give is uh, I- experimental evidence. And those experiments mm. could be of the form of like, like I mentioned with Ayers I- uh, experiment with a sign-up sheet. Those are field experiments in the right. real, in, in the wild. We actually like try to get people to be more pro-social and we is, test isn't it that observability. That ob- right. If their ability goes up, pro-social behavior goes up. Exactly. Okay. That's kind okay. of, that's, Information and support That's of right. your worldview. Let me give you a, another one. So uh, our worldview says that there's something unique about altruism, about ah. charities that works differently from, say, investing or savings decisions. Great. Okay. That, and so you're about to tell me that's a testable hypothesis. That is testable, yeah. And right. you're about to tell me a test. That's right. And in particular, the test is really good at ruling out alternatives, like we're mm. just bad at thinking about numbers, or mm. we just we just can't conceptualize you know, multipliers or, or, or impact right. so easily. Okay, so what you can do, for instance, is you tell people, here's $10. You decide how much of it to keep, how much you give to charity of your choice. Fine. Okay. And I, as the experimenter, I'm going to be generous. I'm going to, I'm going to match whatever you get. Now I'll match it either one to one, or, or maybe I'll tell some other people I'll match it two to one. Right. I'll tell some other people it'll be five ah, to one, up to ten to one. You can manipulate that. Exactly. That's we what experimenters the, do, right? Exactly. They fiendishly manipulate. Exactly. This. And so we can manipulate the match anywhere from one to one, all the way up to t- ten to one. And okay. no effect because people don't care about impact. So it doesn't matter. If you really cared about impact, you would see, see the 10 to 1 match and you'd be like, damn, I'm giving. Yeah, because, because it's going to have 10 times the impact. But it turns out it's flat. People give exactly the same amount when it's a 1 to 1 versus a 10 to 1. The multiplier is irrelevant, irrelevant. to the, this, How, this decision. Exactly. Okay, so maybe I'm an idiot about finance. Exactly. To decision to give. Exactly. So, okay, so here comes a different decision. T- go. That's right. So as soon as you make the decision, so you're right. Maybe I'm an idiot uh, about when it numbers. Comes to finance. Yeah. And I'm just not going to thinking about them. But what happens if we give you a very similar decision, but instead make it about a savings decision <laughs> and say we can either give you a one to one match or a ten to one match, and we'll give you that match, you know, in another day or two. People are really responsive suddenly. Of course. <laughs> suddenly, it's the case that they're when it's your money, thinking about you, you calculate impact. That's right. And it just stands out when you look at the graph of how do how, yeah. how much do people put it, uh, it towards themselves versus how much they put towards the charity down the line that it's flat for the charity really uh, immediately start. rules out the cognitive constraints. That's story. right. So you guys are, if I hear you right, you're fairly convinced that that you and your community are really not just te- not telling just so stories anymore. That, yeah. Like you've banged away on this in all the ways yeah, that scientists do. Yeah, I think that's do. right. Now, for any for any given example we have in the book, there's a chance that our explanation is wrong. That's fine. We, we like we try to give evidence for it, but like you know, we hang our hat on on the approach. The approach is a useful, insightful approach that has evidence for it. But on any given example, of course, you know, as scientists, like our, our priors aren't 100. percent like it could be that something else is going on here. And like, you know, we do yeah. want to update. But one of the things that I think our approach adds is, is parsimony. It's these simple models explain so many puzzles and, and so many different things that seem totally unrelated. A single model seems to fit it well. And yeah, there's some evidence for it. And it's not it's not just just so. But but we really, really, we, we think the approach is what's adding value. The, the approach can explain so much with so little. And, and you're not saying that you you're explaining 100% of why people give exactly. and everything that's interesting. Other things are this going is on. This an underlying thing. Yeah, yeah. Keep that in mind and you'll Keep understand that in mind. Keep stuff that in mind. better. Yeah, cognitive constraints might also be playing a role. You know, for instance, even with the savings decision, it's not, you know, you're not exactly optimizing. It's, it's super not clear to me how your toolkit explains both giving and rap music. Can you Can you cross that chasm? Yeah, I mean, basically what we're saying is that humans evolve the psychology that's designed to, to allow them to play these games. They have tastes and beliefs, uh, ideologies, intuitions that help them do that, and they can help G- them do Games that. about reputation. Sometimes. Yeah. Okay, great. Sometimes they're about reputation. Sometimes they're about signaling things. Sometimes they're about uh, uh, group identity and persuasion. Sometimes yeah. they're about other things. And the, these and these different- So what might so you get, be signaling with rap music? Yes, yeah, so, so yeah, bring the- get, I think that with rap music, the answer is something along the lines of, well, obviously there's some group identity stuff and, the, and there's probably some stuff around cleverness the fact that you can pick up on the stuff that you can keep up that you can memorize them quickly um or is the rap artist that you, you can even come up with it mm-hmm. yeah yeah and if i'm hearing you right the, there are if i'm following some kinds of rap artists that's signaling more that i'm a, like an, an insider that i'm more deep into the yeah, community yeah, right. in, in exactly the same way that if i go to new york and i walk around moma instead of the met 
I'm signaling something about me. Yeah. Yeah. Something, what, what is something about thing? your values, something about your, your training. You, you know, if, if I've never been to an art museum before and I show up, I'm not going to understand 99% of what's going on there. And if I try to explain it to the buddy that I'm, you, you know, there with, I'm going to, you know, sound ill-informed. But if I, if I had parents who brought me to museums growing up, and if I, you know, was able to, you know, go to Harvard and take an art history yeah. class, I'll sound more sophisticated. And so one thing I'm doing is I'm signaling this kind of background knowledge. And that shows up a lot in art. Background knowledge really helps you sound, sound sophisticated. And it, it increases the value of me going to an art museum or, or taking somebody on a day to an art museum is right. then I can sound like. Sometimes you guys come across as weird cultural relativists, right? Like you're saying there's no such thing as better or worse. Yeah. We just with our taste, we signal different things. Do yeah. I have that right? Like is, yeah. is Bach not any better well, than other Baroque uh, composers? He's just the one that we've settled on yeah. to show that we're fancy people who yeah. like Baroque music. Uh, Bach may be better at, well, first of all, Bach may be better at the things that make you um, make it a good signal. Um, and also the aesthetic features, I mean, these kinds of things, the, the thing that you signal is is going to, to some extent, uh, reflect the underlying function of that signal. So for instance, if what you're trying to do is signal something about your background, then what you want is a signal that takes time to learn and that you need to learn with others. And so, ah. and so the, what, what we are saying is that the game theory can help you understand why people, for instance, might like what become wine snob? It's because when when it comes to wine snobbery, it's not just about the fact that the wine is expensive. There's also the fact that you need to learn the language of wine snobbery, and you can only do that with a friend who likes wine, right? So hold on. If, if I go to a fancy restaurant and I want to impress people who I think are fancy and hang out at fancy restaurants, and I say, bring me your most expensive bottle of wine, have I just flunked some tests? Yes. In some sense, yes. I mean, what they'll know is that you have uh, a lot of money in your pocket. What they won't infer and ah. what you often want people to infer is something about your background or your social network. And so wine snobbery is kind of very well designed for that. So is art appreciation, because yeah. art appreciation is all about recognizing some reference in that. Well, not all about it, but one thing that happens is that it, there's some uh, thing that you're looking at and you're like, oh, that reference is this other piece that I also saw when I was back in this other place. And I talked to this person about it and they told me about that and blah, blah, blah. So hold on. I, I, I want to go hang on. I want to get impressed. I want to get taken in by the fancy community who order, who order expensive wine in the right way or talk or, or yeah. appreciate wine in the right way. I blow it if I just order the most expensive For bottle sure. and, try, and try to make that like my, my ticket in. For sure. What do I do to actually get in with these people? You have to, to spend the time to actually learn the language. And, and, and doing that is something not everybody can easily do. And this is why it's ah. actually a credible signal and why it makes sense that our sense of aesthetics would develop. But, but wait, wait, you mean I have to spend time with people who are like, who teach me how to say, well, there's a hint of black current yeah, in the well, finish yeah, here. Yeah. It, to some extent, it's kind of like, like a machine learning process. You need a trainer. You need somebody ah. who tells you like, this is something with a, I, I'm not uh, sophisticated in this domain, but this is something where it has a, that finish that you just described. Yeah. And you need somebody who knows it to teach you that connection. And, you and that tells you something Something about your social network that tells you something about like you having spent time uh, 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 um, learning this skill set. Because you, you got to put in hours to get to the point. You got to put in hours and you need to have the friends to train you. Or, you got to spend hours with the right people exactly. to be able to talk about exactly. the blank current and so, finish of whatever. And this, right, is, this is a good example I, I can't then. shortcut that with money or I can't. Exactly. Fine. Exactly. So this is a good example where the, the si we're, we're doing something more than just saying this is costly segment. Um, a, but when you say costly, you don't mean just dollars. Well, and usually cents. it's interpreted that way. So usually Fine. when people talk about costly signaling, they think it's about signaling wealth. And this is this is an example. Exactly. Right, right, right. Uh, this is an example where actually we can look at the way that wh what's being signaled and try to kind of reverse engineer what information you're trying to convey. And that's that's a little bit more sophisticated than the standard costly signaling story. And and it's also slightly more sophisticated in that it's internalized. People just think wine. You know, wine snobs just think wine. The wine is inherent better and maybe in in some ways it is inherently better but but it doesn't seem like it's it's well, it seems like there's more going on than that, like signaling that you had this training process. And again, if I'm hearing you right, I'm not hanging out with my wine snob friends and learning about how to describe the, the black current finish with conscious strategy exactly. in mind that I want to no. get invited to Davos right. someday. Right. Like, I, I'm necessary. enjoying this. Right. I'm getting reinforced by the whole thing. That's right. And then maybe my ticket to, That's right. to Davos That's right. shows up. And if I may, to get back to, to, to an earlier point about how, like, we're not claiming that there isn't like, better and worse wines by some dimensions. We're okay. not claiming that there isn't like something to art or aesthetics that's real. What we are claiming is that, well, well there may be 
you know, wine that like gets at certain taste buds better. There may be art that is inherently better at communicating certain things, or, you know, maybe, maybe even like a better, like a more sophisticated writing skill. So one, the of art- thing, one of the things you taught me was that Rothko was a, you know, abstract art hero. He actually worked like the Dickens. That's right. And, and what he did is extraordinarily hard yeah. to reproduce. So it's not my That's four-year-old right. can do this. There's, is not correct. There's some way in, there's some dimension, there's some metric at which it is in an objective sense better but our point and we're not the first to say this is like that's that can't explain all of why we like it better or which people will like it better Ah, let me give you one experiment if i can that kind of demonstrates this okay and that's that's this very nice study by by paul bloom and a few few others at yale where they actually showed people you know different art pieces and, oh, I love this one. Yeah, exactly, exactly. This and is, they, you know, they this t- is fiendishly clever. Exactly, it is, it is. And, and they tell them, uh, um, you know, this is an original, or they tell some other subjects. Actually, this is the original. That's the replica. So, so they randomize which one is claimed to be the replica and which one is claimed totally to be the random, original. right? Exactly. And so, so whatever objective dimension you're looking at the art piece of, in, in terms of like its aesthetic appeal or in terms of its creativity or whatever, like that's that, that's randomized whether or not you're told it's the Got original it. or not. Yep. And the one that's the original, you say it's you say it's better. You say it's like prettier to look at. You 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 value it more. You're willing to pay more to obtain it. So that tells you there's more to it than these kind of objective criteria. No, that doesn't and say the that, objective criteria mean nothing. That's something also the audience may have experienced because if you if you think about your you decided to go to the Louvre and you wanted to see the Mona Lisa, in fact. The Mona Lisa is very hard to see at the Louvre, but you can open Wikipedia and you can get a variety of different high resolution images of the Mona Lisa, some of which have been corrected for the effects of time and so on. That's a better way to learn about the Mona Lisa. You can see a better image. And yet that's most people wouldn't think of that as being really special. But going to the Mona Lisa is almost a, to see it physically is almost a spiritual experience. Wait, in e, wasn't there a follow on in the study that, that Mo just described where if you show people pictures of cars instead of yeah, art, right, exactly, it, yeah. it doesn't matter yeah, which one, right. which was the original. That's similar the savings to to uh, to charity contrast that we mentioned before that's a nice comparison treatment that really shows that like oh there's something unique about our sense of aesthetics here so for mechanical objects so objects that actually have practical use like they're actually like you don't care whether it's a replica or right is this celica better than that celica well, exactly who, who the hell like cares? you just want to know that it works and that tells you look but you actually only see the effect about whether it's called the, the replica or the original and how much you like it, how much you're willing to pay for it, how much you value it. Mm-hmm. You only see that effect when we're judging things on their aesthetic appeal. That tells you there's something unique about how aesthetics work All that right. has something to do with signaling so, or something like that. All right, before we throw it up into questions, I, I wanna ask one final question. This toolkit has helped me a great deal to understand what's really going on in the world, to understand the hidden games that are happening all day, every day, all around us. Um, can you actually use this toolkit to change the real world, to, to, to make things happen that you want to? You were part of a study in Kenya that strikes me as pretty good evidence that we can use these ideas to make things better. Talk about it. Yeah. Um, so the, the study in, te- in Kenya involved a population that was suffering from tuberculosis, which uh, unfortunately, and at least until COVID, was the world's number one killer amongst infectious diseases in the world. Um, the uh, the funny thing about that is that, to, well, not funny, it's tra- the particularly tragic thing about that is that tuberculosis actually has a cure and has had one since the 1940s. Um, the problem is that you really have to take the medication for a really, really long time. The medication itself is going to make you feel sick. You have to go back to the clinic all the time in order and to- And after your symptoms- go away. Exactly. You have to take unpleasant medication for a long time to truly nuke the bacteria. That's right. And, okay. and you're doing that in a place where there's a stigma against tuberculosis. Um, and uh, often there's a terrible transportation networks. So you're taking half day off of work every time. So people give up and they- hope- my, my symptoms have gone. I'm not going through this hassle anymore. That's right. we're, we're good. But that's a bad idea. Well, from their standpoint, is it? Fine. Maybe, maybe from not. From a public health standpoint. A disaster. Right? Because okay, a lot of the, some of the time they're cured, but a lot of the time they're not. And when they're not, that they develop, um, uh, they're be, they become uh, infectious again, and they may develop drug resistance, which is harder to treat, and which is something that really is quite scary from a public health standpoint, because eventually we might not be able to well, treat so This it is all. a nasty problem, right? Because from an individual's cost-benefit perspective, not taking the medication anymore once your symptoms go away feels like the right call. From a, from a, a community perspective, it's mm. deeply the wrong call. That's right. 
So do you just pay people a ton of money to go take the rest of their medicine? That would absolutely work if you paid them enough, but sometimes you can't do that. Okay. And so there might be an alternative and that might alternative might be, can we turn on that sense of altruism a little bit like in the study that Mo was describing earlier, where we were trying to get people to sign up for a program that prevented uh, blackouts and, and energy efficiency. Okay. So once we know more about how altruism and cooperation works, we can help with this situation. Right. What do we do? So- we talked about observability. There are a few other things that we can do by thinking about the details of how reputations work. Good. Typically, when we design these kinds of interventions that are designed to turn on the psychology, we think about three key things. One is increasing observability, the one we talked about. Another one is to lock out plausible excuses to, to make it so that people can't just easily say, oh, my dog ate my phone or whatever. Um, they ate my, you know, the medication, I, I ran out. Like We have to eliminate that excuse. Because if I'm hearing you right, they will believe those excuses themselves. They're not, just, they're not just things they tell other people. That's right. And we okay. need to make it the case that when they make those excuses, that they cannot easily make those excuses and for their reputation not to take a hit. That's, that's uh -huh. how to think about it. And then the third thing is we really have to communicate the expectation that this is the thing that they're doing is something that they should do. And it's something that the community expects for the welfare of the community. Which we call a norm, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, fine. Yeah. So uh, communicate the norm, eliminate uh, um, uh, plausible, plausible excuses, uh, increase uh, observability. That's how we build the intervention. What we did specifically- Hold on, here, there's a wrinkle here because you, if I'm remembering right, you can't just increase observability inside the, the person's um, local community because of the stigma about the disease. That's right. You cannot parade around uh, the fact that this person has tuberculosis. That is a bit of a constraint for increasing observability. We have to do something a little different. So, so what we did was we built a cell phone platform. This is an area where people have high cell phone use that we were working in. Um, and that cell phone platform had a few key features. Number one was it would send a text message reminder. Okay. Um, it would say, could you please log in and verify that you've taken your medication? If you fail to verify, it would send another one. Yep. If it failed to verify again, it would send another one. Yep. And then at that point, if you failed after three times to verify, you would get a put on a list and there would be a group of people who would follow up and uh, see why you'd fallen off the wagon. Great. That group of people, um, uh, w w let me stop there and show you how this relates to the two uh, things, to two of the three things mm -hmm. that we've already talked about. Number one is notice we could have just sent you a text message. But the problem with doing that is, A, there's no observability, and B, there's tons of excuses. My dog ate my phone. Yeah. If instead we're doing something somewhat burdensome, which is actually asking you to log in and verify and following up and oh. following up again, both of those things go away. Number one, you know there's a, a group of humans who you eventually develop a relationship with okay. who care about you and want to follow up with you and so on. So there's some observability towards them. Okay. And number two is there's no excuse. Your dog ate your phone, find another one. Yep. Right. So, so we're not letting you off the hook mm -hmm. by bugging you mm -hmm. until we hear back from you. That's right. So the game for our standpoint is to take this, this game theoretic background that we know, which if you describe it in game theory is things about first order beliefs and higher order beliefs and multiple equilibria, which is too abstract to be practical mm -hmm. and then communicate to uh, convert that into something that's actionable, like increase observability, eliminate possible excuses. And then there's one more step, which is what does that mean when what you're doing is building a cell phone prop for it? Mm -hmm. But if you can think about that clearly and say, oh, wait, a text message reminder doesn't have observability and leaves yeah. lots of excuses yep. on the table. What's an alternative? That's the way in which we can use that game theory in order to do something useful. So we can take this toolkit and apply it to things in the real world to try to affect some change. If you understand what's driving people, if you understand yeah. the motivations, even, even the ones that they're not consciously aware of. In fact, maybe even particularly the particularly ones that they're when, not yeah, consciously then, aware then of. That gives you a lot of uh, leverage to, to affect people's behavior and potentially for good. I like it. I think this is a good time for us to throw it back to Benjamin. Benjamin, do we have some questions from the audience that, that these guys can dive in on? Yeah, we definitely do. Unfortunately, I don't think we'll get through all of them, but let's jump in. So I'm going to start with two questions that are kind of about the hidden nature of the games and the rules of the game. So I'm just going to start with this one. Are there ways in which the hidden nature of the games is beneficial to us? Does making the choice conscious result in poorer outcomes? Um, there are sometimes ways in which the fact that it's hidden is useful to us. Sometimes it's just the way things work is we tend to internalize stuff that's useful to us. But sometimes the very fact that we are not conscious of it uh, is useful to us. This isn't something we ended up talking about so much in, in the book. But when it comes to altruism, for instance, the fact that we're not conscious of the reputational mm -hmm. returns does make us more trustworthy. And we do have some work uh, showing this. So someone, someone who calculates how they can get 
you know, reputational benefits from their good deeds. So, so if I, if I think through like, well, do I want to do air as ah, a favor? Yeah. Well, yeah. Only then, then you're Machiavellian. Then, exactly. Then you're just kind of a, a jerk. Exactly. Jerk. Exactly. And, and not a good friend and not a particularly trustworthy friend because, well, if the favor then costs me a lot, I won't be there anymore. And uh, so there's times when you don't want to say the quiet part out loud. That's right. There's times when I benefit from it being hidden. And, right. and one way that you can actually not say the quiet part out loud is to act, not be calculating. And so you, in some to, to not know the quiet part. That's yeah. right. Exactly. Uh-huh. Fine. To not right. calculate in first yeah. and just do the right thing uh, um, in an intuitive fashion. So should we not read your book because then we'll know the quiet part? Like that's just skip the last third. <laughs> <laughs> Benjamin, what else do we have? <laughs> Yeah, um, since you brought up reputation, I'm going to ask this question from Timothy Richardson, um, who just wants to know, could you talk about the social ramifications of reputation? Why is reputation so important to us? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, Uh, Mm -hmm. there's so many ways I could take that question. I'll start by just saying the fact that the the fact that we can keep track of reputations is probably what allows us to have large scale cooperation in the first place. This is a point that um, Rob Boyd makes the book uh, that you can pick up is called uh, A Different Kind of Animal. Um, and the students like uh, um, uh, Joe Henrik will also make this point. Humans stand out in the ability to, to cooperate and not just to, to do it with like two or three individuals or a clan of 15 individuals, but to do it at a very large scale. It, right, one of the things that's weird about us is that we cooperate at scales that are kind of unknown elsewhere in the animal kingdom. Right? Well, until you get to other, other ways of cooperating, like with ants, where yeah, yeah. sure enough, they can also cooperate at very Pretty large unusual. scales. Um, but yeah, it is pretty unusual. We can do cities, um, and that's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. In order to do that, you do need a, a sense of reputation, and um, uh, this is an oversimplification, but you need to be able to do things like keep track of uh, not just did I get harmed by that individual, but did that individual do something that's uh, considered bad, and did other people then respond in the ways I think they should have responded, or should I also uh, mm-hmm. be upset at them? But uh, let me just add to that. There's other aspects of your reputation that are important and, and including important for sustaining cooperation. One of which is you might want to signal something about, about your values, or you might want to mm-hmm. signal something about like your sense of empathy. And so, 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 you know, for instance, if I am, if I'm kind towards animals, say if I'm vegetarian or if I'm like, you know, uh, ha- have a cat that I, I, I like hanging out with, like that says something about my, my degree of sympathy, which might also make me more trustworthy as a romantic partner or, or you know, a, as a friend, I, I seem to have this part of my brain functioning well. And, and that's, that's you- useful. Thing dogs to instead of kick them when you walk by them. I, on that's the a good thing to signal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, fine. <laughs> Which is why we don't see we see relatively few dog kickers. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, then, and again, it's not conscious. Not right? conscious at all. Not fine. conscious at all. That's right. And then so that's that's another another way in which your reputation m- uh, might be affected by by good deeds is, is you could develop a reputation for being empathetic, for instance. And that's slightly different from Arizona's right. story. And then Reputations another are multifaceted. Another story about reputations that I, that I think is, is really important is peer pressure. So we often have norms and norms are enforced by, by peer pressure. Third party punishment is the technical jargon, which is if I litter on the street, you know, some, some this happened to me when I was young, you know, some guy pulls up in his pickup truck, you know, I, I finished my popsicle stick, I throw it out, I'm like 12 at the time. And this guy pulls up in his pickle truck and he gets out and he says, was that yours? And that was the last time I littered. And so, so that's, you know, I, I learned very quickly, uh, uh, you know, for, I've now internalized this and now, yeah. now I think it's really bad to litter. You but don't like, litter when nobody's watching. Exactly. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that litter when nobody's w- watching even because I've internalized this, but like part of that internalization came from this social pressure. And that social pressure is also really important for sustaining cooperation is, is we, we enforce norms. We peer pressure each other to do things. And one of the things you guys have taught me is that um, if you continue to be a litterer, E will not hang out with you, even if you don't, even if you're not a litterer. That's right. Like having littering friends is not cool for you. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and in fact, it's even uh, stronger than that. If I did hang out with Mo, when everybody knew that Mo was a litterer, people would stop hanging out with me, even if I don't litter, which is known as higher order punishment. Mm-hmm. And that and that's part of the glue that holds like, us together. Was, why do you have these friends that are like so so? You know, they go, they violate all these norms. They clearly don't care about the environment. Like I, you haven't taught Moshe, you haven't told him, yeah, but yeah. like. Yeah. But, so and, to, and so I'll, I'll slowly start to shun not just you, mm-hmm. but him. Higher order punishment. And this is actually really important for sustaining cooperation. That's right. Yeah. To get norms off the ground, you really need those two key features. You need peer punishment, th- third party punishment, technical jargon, and higher order punishment. You need the fact that I'll get punished for not punishing other people that I see violating these norms. And Once you have, sorry, and just to bring back to the to the question, what you see here is like, what are some of the key features that reputations have to have? And these would be two of them. Yeah. 
it struck me after reading your book, there are very few things more important to us than reputation, right? We want clothing if we're out in the cold, we need food. Yeah. But for a social species like us, reputation is just paramount. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. If your reputation, I mean, as you see, I don't know, take, take the, the people who have been taken down by, say, the, the Me Too movement, yeah. right? These are people with a ton of wealth. Uh, mm -hmm. But like, that doesn't save them. And like their lives are tremendously worse once they've been, been called out by this movement for, for their past misdeeds. Like they, once you lose whether the status, or not, whether once you or not lose... we care, whether or not we're sympathetic to them, keep in mind that their lives are deeply, deeply worse as a result of getting the th third party punishment hurts. hurts. Uh, and and it, it hurts, especially for a species, but we rely on our social network. We rely on our reputations to, to, to have any, any amount of power, to have any amount of status, that stuff matters to us. The okay. worst thing that could happen to a Roman Senator would, would be that he would be sent off and couldn't come back to Rome and he could keep his wealth but he was just ostracized. That was that the was toughest the punishment they had? Happen, yeah. <laughs> Benjamin? I'm oh, gonna pivot, maybe. yeah. I'm gonna pivot to this next question um, that just came in a few minutes ago, but I'm curious and I'm hoping we can expand it into other form ways of thinking about this. But Gabriel Gesmer in the audience asks, how do you explain the significant minority of donors to charity who choose to give anonymously? <laughs> All right. You know, you know what, Benjamin, you know what the definition of a great question is? One where they've got an entire chapter of the book about it. Awesome. Glad to hear it. <laughs> um, so the, so some people give and they give loudly, but some people give more anonymously and uh, more quietly. And you might ask the question, well, wouldn't you want other people to know about your good deeds? And wouldn't they want to know about it? That's the puzzle here. Um, in in brief, the way we think about this- Wait, Wasn't there a Curb Your Enthusiasm? Yeah, yeah, that's that's good, yeah. Tell, tell it, because that's, uh, I love that episode. So uh, his name is Larry, right? And, Larry and, David. Yeah, yeah, Larry David goes to, uh, and he gives to a museum and uh, he, he and his wife go to the museum and he's so proud and he shows his wife. And the whole premise of Curb Your Enthusiasm is he says the quiet part out oh, loud wonderful. over and that's over, right? Yeah. So his giving is super out loud and explicit because he wants the loud. reputation benefit. He mm -hmm. does, and he's really proud of it. And his wife is- a little proud. bit muted in her pride and then turns her face her her, uh, her gaze to the other side Ten where dancing. where somebody has given anonymously and the person who has given anonymously turns out to be his arch rival Ted Danson who is kind of trying to hit on his wife and that's part of the fun but what happens is at, he gets kind of upset about this and in particular he gets more and more upset over the course of the evening as he finds out that everybody there knows <laughs> that Ted Danson has been is the anonymous giver and so they're all like oh do you know that it's Ted that gave anonymously well how do you know that well he told me but he only told me and and so at the end of the evening he says if I could have given anonymously and told everyone, I would have, if I knew that that were an option, I would have taken that option. And part of what's going on with anonymous giving is that you are giving up something. You, the average person who will come up yep. off the street when they come to the museum will not know that it was Ted Danson that gave that. Wing. His name is not on the museum wing. That's he right. could tell he's, Cheryl. He's anonymous, right? Yeah. To, Cheryl might find out that Cheryl, uh, uh, Larry David's uh, uh, wife. And Ted kind of wants Cheryl. That's important. And wants Cheryl to find out that the average museum goer won't find out. That's yeah, kind of the yeah. key point. Is, there's there's is, a signal like I'm super elite. Exactly. Only the in crowd knows that I'm actually Bella. Exactly. And, and so, we're, so you're telling a Machiavellian story about this again, or or, or a, but not a calculated. That's story. right. Again, that's it can exactly happen right. all intuitively. I mean, if you think about things like uh, people naturally being uh, modest, think about. Um, uh, crazy rich Asians and the, the main character there, Nick, who doesn't even tell his girlfriend uh, mm. of a year that he's coming from a very rich background. That's something we tend to admire, actually. And we're here across the river from Boston, the home of the Brahmins, who were right. famously modest about hmm. their giving and their that's philanthropy. Right. That's right. There's the old ditty that says that uh, Brahmins, uh, that there's the, the Cabots uh, who only talk to the Wachamacallums and the Wachamacallums who only talk to God, right? Yep. Um, they will not tell, they might talk amongst themselves a little bit about their, their do-goodery, but they certainly will not advertise it beyond. But the thing that the, to answer the question, the fact that you are giving up on some relationships mm -hmm. is in an, and willing to do so is relationships in meaning that people outside of your community won't necessarily find out that you did these good deeds. That, that average person out there, I'm that's, willing to give that up. That's in part, that's the point. That yeah. is entirely the point. I'm signaling that I'm not doing it just to get the average person to like me. And we're going to say it one more time. It's not that everybody's sitting around on the whiteboard drawing this out and being that's calculated. Right. This right. is just, this is the hidden that's game. Right. That's they going just on. learned that it's modesty is good. It's Machiavellian Marky, Marky in, in some sense, in a subconscious sense, Great. but consciously it's not. Hidden game. Mm -hmm. Benjamin? 
So we're running out on time. Apologies to everyone. We've got you have some a final fantastic phenomenal questions. questions. Oh gosh. Um, okay. Well, I do want to ask this one just because it's a little bit more about the mechanics of what you were talking about. So I just want to end on the process of collaboration. Someone asks, what are some more tips for increasing observability in processes to incite collaboration? Talk about energy efficiency. That was a great example. Yeah. Uh, so with energy efficiency, what we what we were doing was um, getting people to sign up for a program that prevents blackouts. Traditionally, the way that the a utility had done that was to sign people up by having sending them a mailer, telling them about the program, and then asking them to call into a hotline. We immediately recognized, wait, the, the problem here is there's no observability. They get home, they're busy, they need to make dinner, and nobody will ever find out about the good deeds. And so there's no way that the psychology will get turned on in the first place. We got to find a different way to engage them. And so Th we, this intervention is not going to work. It's zero not observable. Yeah. Fine. And so we said, what's a, a simple way we could increase observability? Well, instead of having them call into a hotline, we'll just put up a sign up sheet, not super high. -tech. In the lobby, no. where all their neighbors can see but it. But everybody can see it. They're walking by the mailboxes <laughs> and everybody can see the names. And, and that's what, what I love about this is these, these interventions are not heavyweight in a lot of cases, right? Yeah, so you can be. activate this stuff kind of easily mm -hmm. well it takes some work to do it in a natural way yeah, and, yeah. you know it takes some work on the background you can you can see we probably spent a month thinking about should we okay. build a fancy app should we do these yeah. things but when we settled on the sign up sheet and finally thought of it it felt very natural so yeah it, it was lightweight in that sense mm -hmm. yep um it, guys if you're interested in this um e has a ted talk which is up on ted.com if you just search for erez yoeli y-o-e-l-i and ted you're going to find his talk which is all about the toolkit to get people to be more cooperative altruistic pro-social shameless plug it it's good stuff brilliant well i think we're going to have to, to cut it there. I just want to encourage everyone who asks questions to please check out the book. Hopefully it can answer some of them. Um, any closing remarks from the three of you? Thank you for joining us. Why don't you give your Twitter and, handles? Because I know yeah. both of you are active and you yeah. can interact with people on That's Twitter. Right. Mm -hmm. At Moshe, my first name, underscore Hoffman. Uh, follow, we like to point out interesting social puzzles and the hidden games that are involved. And ask us those questions and then we'll- we That's right, we, we, we are responsive, um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, find us, send us a message, uh, add us. And if you didn't have a chance to ask your question here today, ask us online. And I'm at, at Erezioeli, no underscore. I'm, I'm in McAfee uh, and I'll just forward stuff onto these guys. <laughs> Okay, I'm putting everything in the chat so people oh, have yeah, access great. to your handles. Yeah, please come join. It's a, it's a fascinating conversation. Yeah, again, we've gotten some brilliant questions. So I hope people are able to, to send them the, your way. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you um, for this fantastic conversation. It's clearly inspired a lot of conversation. Um, again, thank you everyone out there for spending part of your afternoon with us. Please learn more about this book and purchase hidden games at harvard.com. I put the link in the chat a couple of times. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, the Harvard Division of Science, and the Harvard Library, all here in Cambridge, Massachusetts, enjoy the rest of your day. Keep reading and be well. Thanks for joining us again. This has been great. Thanks, all.